Thomas, how are you? How are you? Great. Been a tiring day? Yes, but the, the, that's the way I like it. Yeah. Now, you mentioned in your book that as a young child, uh, you began to doubt that there was God, n not so much a, a God, but sort of what you were learning in your early Sunday school. You were doubting. Uh, were there any other external forces you attribute, uh, you attribute to your atheism as you grew older, or was it all through reason and logic that you became one? Ah, very good question. Well, what I doubted when I was a kid was that there was a God who intervened in my life or anyone else's. That, that seemed extraordinary, or, or a God that made the leaves green so they would suit my eyes, as they were saying. But, um, and I've never thought that there was even a chance that that was true. But at that time, it hadn't struck me that the belief, as well as being foolish or self-centered, could also be a dangerous belief. And I think that all the things that have happened to me since have been to do with the evidence that the belief is a dangerous one. That people want God to intervene so he can either give them a bonus or punish their enemies, or make them win a battle or a war, or afflict other people with disease if they've been... Uh, sexually indiscreet or something of this kind. So that all, all the revelations, revelations, all the insights I've had since have been to do with the discovery that this is not just a stupid opinion, but a pop one. And uh, when did you start the book writing process? The book talks about a wide spectrum of religions and different sects of the religion. Uh, did did the research take long, and did you ever find yourself uh, in trouble when collecting religious information for for the use of an anti-religious book? To answer your question in reverse order, no, I never felt in any danger of writing it. Um, but I've been writing it on and off for a long time. I, I, I've always known I wanted to do something like this. And wherever I was in the world, whether it was Uganda or Saudi Arabia or uh, the West Bank or Iran, um, I was making notes for it and reading up on it and, and assembling a big library of books on it, which I have in my house. And uh, as an adolescent, when you were growing up, did you consider yourself a contrarian? Uh, what did your friends or family think of this as you began to phase into an <laughs> I wouldn't have known to say the word contrarian at that age. I was considered by my friends and family to be a pen in the ass. Yeah. I think, if I remember distinctly because I think it was something about me that yeah, you should better ask them. Um, but I, I remember thinking that, that the, the, whatever you want to call it, the conventional wisdom or the accepted consensus was, it had a very good chance of being wrong. Um, whereas uh, what one was taught was that yeah, it was, the majority was likely to be in the right, in fact, there is a saying, Vox Populi Vox Dei, the worst of the people is the worst of God. And um, in some way, one wanted to quarrel with that too. And uh, in writing the book, you took a stab at some Eastern religions, such as uh, Buddhism. Did you find this harder to do, considering many people, A, do not know much about Buddhism, and uh, B, not a lot of people, when they think of Buddhism, do they think of... Um, a sort of harsh religion. They think of some sort of uh, peaceful religion with monks. Indeed. I mean, the, the Buddhists who say it's not really a religion at all. It might be a faith or a spiritual practice or, or, or a um, custom. It's not, it's not a religion in the sense of being a God-fearing system. Well, the thing about that and other Eastern practices is that they're equally um, imprecise and vague as to what they really do entail. For example, to take today's news, we're talking on the 9th of October 2007, the streets of Burma, Rangoon, full of people trying to resist a military dictatorship of unusual cruelty. Now that dictatorship keeps itself in power by saying it's Buddhist, and has been building stupas, as they call them, uh, Buddhist temples, you know, for 30 years. So to, materialize its claim to be a holy regime. Well, its opponents are Buddhists too. Who, how am I going to tell which of them is the real Buddhist? I don't think these questions can be decided. People make these things up as they go along. They, they present us with a la carte opinions. And, and you found out that you were Jewish uh, on your mother's side, which in, 
Jewish customs and laws would make you Jewish, and you encourage your family to participate in uh, Jewish seders. Uh, is this something you're doing so that your daughter can establish her roots to Judaism, or is there some uh, other reason why you would like this no, to I mean, occur? I, I've taken my daughter to a Protestant Episcopalian um, service in Washington National Cathedral, for example, and I have an Italian friend who's going to take her to a Latin Roman Catholic Mass, where I wouldn't be much help for her in showing her. So, of course, I wanted to understand all these things. The reason one has a Seder, which is my own house, is so that she knows that she has the option of studying the, or even if she wants to, following a tradition. She has the option of following all the others too, but this is the one, the only one in which, which I could say belonged to her or she had a uh, claim. And in the book you express uh, disdain at the is Islamic religion and its exclusivity and how they treat non-believers uh, uh, poorly. Do you think that as soon as the Quran was written, it was just a ticking time bomb before uh, mm -hmm. Islamofascism took place? Or do you think that the Islamofascism came as a result of Islam's taking it too far? In other words, uh, was the Quran written to be destructive of other faiths, or do you think it is the fault of the believers? Yes, I know, I know, what, you're, I know what you're driving at. I mean, of course, Islam doesn't always take a big Ladenist form, or a Salafist, or Wahhabi form, um, at all, N neither at all times, nor in all places, so that we can make that distinction. However, it does say that it is the last and final word of God, and supersedes all other religions. In other words, um, Christianity doesn't mention Islam in its texts, nor does Judaism. Um, Islam mentions Christianity and Judaism in its texts to say, Yes, yes, these exist, but we are better, we're superior, we complete uh, our work, so that there is in Islam a much more arrogant claim than any of the other monotheisms. And it's very dangerous to say that God has spoken the last and final word that can't be improved upon. Um, it's, of course, very intolerant of any religion that comes after Islam, <coughs> such as, for example, the Baha'i faith in Islam. Uh, in Iran, where any, I believe practically any member of it is almost subject to death for that reason alone. And of course, for non monotheistic religions such as Hinduism, it has nothing to do with But I think the, yeah. the danger of it is simply that it is an implicitly totalitarian claim. With this book, this Quran, this recitation, you don't need any other books. Everything is now complete. That's, that's an awful statement. And is there any faith that you have come across that you simply had no way to ridicule or find an argument against uh, in your book? Um, there would be no act of faith that I wouldn't find ridiculous because the, my daughter goes to a Quaker school, as it happens as well, um, the rest of the time. Many people find Quakers inoffensive, but I find that no matter now, I, I find them offensive because they preach non resistance to evil. I think is, a, is an immoral doctrine. But um, all religions, whether it's the Dalai Lama or the Quakers or the Jains, all make the same mistake of preferring uh, faith over reason. And reason is the only candle by which we can read. And um, we'll see. Yeah, and uh, something uh, that's been happening in current events now is uh, the president of Iran in the U.S., and uh, we've heard from more than one politician uh, that, uh, that they would like to attack Iran, including uh, Joseph Lieberman, who ran as president uh, a vice few president. years, uh, vice president, sorry, a few years back. Now, what are your thoughts on, you know, these attacks on Iran, do you think they're justified uh, just as the attacks on Iraq, or is it something that's completely different? If we uh, allow the Iranian theocracy to become a nuclear power, it means that international law, international agreements, international treaties of any kind, international understandings of any kind, are null and void and meaningless. It would mean that we watched as the Iranian rulers tore up every conversation they'd ever had with the International Atomic Energy Authority, the IEA, with the European Union or with the UN. I mean, 
All of this was just paper, and we would just have to sit there and take it. Nothing could be more dangerous than that. And when I say nothing could be more dangerous than that, I mean, I mean nothing. Um, which means that I think that if they are found to have secretly constructed uh, facilities for the nuclear weapons, those facilities must be demolished. And I would hope that the byproduct would be the demolition of the theocracy as well, which is, uh, since you used the term for Mr. Ahmadinejad, is an unwashed, scrofulous, uncultured taxi driver. Calling President of Iran, we challenged the claim of these people to represent the great civilization of Persia. They were not chosen to do so. They were not voted to do so. They, they, they strangled the culture and life of their own country. We would like to see what Persia would be like without a coercive religious power forced on it in this way. But so one thing at a time, the first thing is, no, we cannot coexist. We cannot coexist with the nuclear theocracy. We will not and should not exist. If we only take down the nuclear bit, that's, that's a necessary condition. But I would hope that there would be an ancillary condition, which would be that the theocracy would go as well. And we would take our place with, by the side of the Persian people and their civilization against this <coughs> diseased, um, revolting, Thank you very much, Christopher. It's a, it's a pleasure. Thank uh, that's, you all, that's, all, that's all the time we have for now, but well, this is uh, God is Not Great. It's been on the New York Times best-selling uh, list. Uh, it was number one. Uh, for very very briefly. Time. Very briefly. <laughs> but uh, I saw one it on week, the list. but they can't take yeah. that away from me. So thank you very much. <laughs>